Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our continuing series on the 2020 election. Between now and the election day on uh, November 3rd, we're going to be uh, continue to bring you some of the country's leading political experts talking about various aspects of the campaign and the election. All of these events are free and they're open to the public. We live stream them to our YouTube station where you can see them live or at a later date. Uh, I wanna thank the College of Arts and Sciences at Washington State University for their support of this series and their support of the Institute. If you'd like to know more about the series or any of our programs at the Institute, I, I um, uh, ask you to join or to uh, like us on Facebook and you'll receive information about our upcoming events or you can go to our website at foley.wsu.edu. So today's event is going to examine the state of the campaign for seats in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Currently, Democrats enjoy a 34-seat advantage in the House, while Republicans hold a three-seat advantage in the Senate. While the entire House is up for election this year and Democrats could lose seats, it's unlikely they will lose their majority. However, in the Senate, there are 35 seats up in this cycle, including special elections in Arizona and Georgia. Two thirds of these are currently held by Republicans. So it's a favorable map for Democrats in the Senate. So what's going to happen in November? Will Democrats retake control of the Senate? Will Republicans pick up seats in the House or will Democrats strengthen their majority there? And what will be the implications for politics and policy in the next Congress? Fortunately, we have the perfect guest to answer some of these questions. Costas Panagopoulos is a professor and chair of the political science department at Northeastern University. His work focuses on campaigns and elections, voting behavior, and campaign finance. Previously, he was a professor of political science at Fordham University, where he founded and directed the Center for Electoral Politics and Democracy. He has been a visiting scholar at Yale, Columbia, George Washington, and the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies at American University. Casas is the author of numerous articles in leading political science journals, and is the author or co-author of several books, including Political Campaigns, Concepts, Contexts, and Consequences, published by Oxford University Press, A Citizen's Guide to U.S. Elections, which was published by Rutledge Press, and All Roads Lead to Congress, published by the CQ Press. He currently serves as the editor of the journal American Politics Research, and since 2006, he has been a member of the decision team desk at NBC News. Professor Panagopoulos is going to speak for about 30 minutes or so, and after that, we'll have some time for some discussion. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me at T.S. Foley, as in Tom S. or uh, uh, Thomas S. Foley at WSU.edu. So, Costas, it's great to see you. I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I'll be back later with some questions from our audience. Thank you very much, Cornell. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here today to talk with you about this exciting election cycle. Uh, and um, I want to uh, thank you for this kind invitation and also to uh, applaud your excellent work in bringing together some of the country's uh, leading experts to talk about uh, the election in this series. It's my privilege to be part of this uh this group of um, seasoned experts. And um, I hope I can uh, add to the conversation focusing, uh, of course, on the congressional elections this year. Uh, I will um, do so with the aid of some audio visuals. And so if you will indulge me, I will now um, share my screen and uh, make visible some slides that are prepared for this discussion and um, be back uh, after that presentation for more discussion and Q&A. So I hope that everyone is able to see um, my PowerPoint slides. Um, let's, of course, uh, just revisit uh, the current state of affairs as Cornell uh, nicely summarized. Um, and I will just repeat here so that everyone is on the same page, uh, what things look like in terms of the current composition of the US Senate. Uh, of course, in the uh, in, the, in the Senate, Republicans have 53 seats. Democrats have 45 seats with two independent senators who caucus uh, 
uh, with Republicans, uh, with Democrats. And uh, of course, this is in the aftermath of the uh, 2018 midterm election cycle, uh, during which we had quite um, a shakeup, mainly in the US House of Representatives, which switched party control from Republican control to Democratic control. Democrats um, uh, now have 232 seats of the 435 in the House. Republicans have 197 with one libertarian and five vacancies that are all up for election uh, this year. I'd like to set the stage by talking about some um, of the um, conditions under which the current elections are unfolding, the backdrop against which current elections are unfolding, and some of the trends and patterns that political scientists have detected uh, and that argue are uh, important because they have implications for this year uh, in uh, over the course of, of the past few decades. And so one of the um, uh, kind of the main uh, observations about congressional elections uh, is that it is incredibly powerful to be an incumbent seeking re-election, even in years that are not terribly favorable for incumbents, incumbents do fairly well. Uh, what you can see here on this, uh, in this figure is that incumbent re-election rates in the House, depicted here uh, in the solid blue line, have consistently been over 90% uh, over this period from 1972 to 2012. This persisted in 2016 and in 2018 as well. Um, this uh, rate of re-election has been relatively stable over time, uh, but considerably high. In the Senate, um, the re-election rates have not been as high at the, during the early part of this period, but they've caught up to the House re-election rates in, re in recent years, uh, such that um, it is not uncommon for over 80% and sometimes over 90% of senators seeking re-election uh, to be re-elected. And uh, one of the strong patterns that we see here is the rising rate of incumbent re-election for members of the U.S. Senate, such that it is now virtually indistinguishable from the very high rate um, of uh, re-election that we've observed in House elections. Now, this is really interesting because it's occurring um, at the same time that we detect some decline in what we as political scientists call the incumbency advantage, which is the extra bump that you get in terms of percentage points of the vote just by, vir by virtue of being an incumbent. Um, sometimes uh, this happens because incumbents have an opportunity to uh, do a good job representing their districts or provide particularistic benefits or other kinds of uh, benefits to their constituents. Um, you know, they perform uh, a lot of um, uh, constituent favors and other offer other types of support uh, and in an effort to cultivate the so-called personal vote. Uh, and they do so pretty successfully. That amounts to the incumbency advantage I alluded to a moment ago. But we see that while this was rising, climbing from about the 1950s to the 1980s, in recent election cycles, this has been on the decline. That doesn't mean that incumbents are not reelected at very high rates. It just means that the uh, incumbency advantage in terms of the, the points accrued just by virtue of being an incumbent has been on the decline. This is also true um, for incumbent senators running for re-election. Uh, again, here we see that uh, the incumbency advantage for U.S. senators seeking re-election was climbing from the 70s till about the mid-1990s, has since started to come down, but they are still getting re-elected at relatively high rates. One of the other uh, characteristics of congressional elections that we've observed in recent years is growing nationalization of congressional elections, which is to say that the impact of what's happening nationally, what's going on uh, with the president, what's going on with conditions at the national level uh, is increasingly influential in determining how people vote in congressional elections. Here is some uh, evidence about national of nationalization in midterm House elections. What's being plotted here is the impact of local considerations on House uh, vote choice in contested elections for the U.S. House in midterm elections versus national conditions. And what you see is that um, local conditions until about 1998. Um, from 1954 
uh, were much more potent than national conditions in shaping the House vote in midterm elections. Uh, roughly at the end of the 1990s, that switched such that national considerations are now much more important and increasingly important between the period of the mid 2000s to 2014, increasingly important relative to local considerations. So there's evidence here um, that suggests that people are, uh, that, pe that people's vote in house elections is increasingly influenced by what's happening at the national level compared to what's going on in their local conditions. This is um, uh, also supported by evidence um, examining the correlation between the vote for president and gubernatorial votes. Um, if you look at this from uh, the 1930s to um, the most recent elections, what you see is that the correlation is getting stronger and stronger since about the 1970s. And in particularly in the aftermath of the 2008 election, that correlation has continued to climb. That doesn't mean it's never been very high, you know, as high as this before. We see relatively high correspondence between the vote for president and the vote for governor in the 40s and 50s, but that dropped somewhat um, uh, in, starting in the mid 50s to about the early uh, 1970s uh, when it started to climb again. But increasing nationalization is happening um, even if we look at this evidence. And even when we look at national exit polls, here are some exit poll results from the 2018 election. Uh, what you see is that um, uh, voters' considerations of the president were very, very powerful in shaping their vote for the US House in the midterm election in 2018. So among voters who supported Trump in 2018, 95% of them voted for the Republican House candidate. Among the voters who opposed Trump, 94% voted for the Democratic candidate for the House seat in 2018. And those for whom Trump was not a factor, which is roughly a third of the 2018 electorate, split more evenly. Uh, Republicans actually had an advantage amongst those voters, 52-44 in 2018. But again, uh, the way that voters felt about Trump in 2018 shaped in large part how they voted for members of the or candidates in the US House. Again, uh, ev strong evidence of nationalization. We also have a situation in which uh, the cost of winning congressional elections has been climbing uh, since, um, well, climbing for several decades, but in particular here uh, is some evidence from uh, 1986 to about uh, to 2012. Uh, these are uh, figures are adjusted for inflation. And you could see that, uh, that in both the House and the Senate, um, the costs have been escalating, particularly in House elections. You can see just how big the increase has been uh, in terms of the average cost of winning a House seat uh, in 2012 dollars. And you see the same thing for the Senate, uh, a 62 percent increase from 86 to 2012 in the amount of money it took to win a House seat over this period. This election cycle um, is no exception and neither is the presidential election cycle. If you just look at total campaign receipts for presidential candidates just one cycle ago to where we are today, to date, um, the 2020 cycle, in the 2020 cycle, the candidates have raised more than twice as much so far as they raised in 2016 uh, over the course of the entire um, election period. Uh, so this is happening at the presidential level. Uh, and even if you look at campaign expenditures uh, and how they have changed, uh, sorry, independent campaign expenditures from 2016 to 2020, what you see is that in the 2020 cycle to date, over a billion dollars has been spent in independent expenditures in congressional general election races so far, which is almost twice what it was uh, in the um, 2016 uh, period in the same types of races. So. Uh, it's getting more expensive, um, but the candidates uh, and the independent expenditure groups seem to be having uh, little difficulty amassing these funds to spend in campaigns. We, of course, have other developments that are uh, important. Um, growing partisanship and stability in the electorate is evident in both House and Senate elections. Uh, here is some evidence um, suggesting that House elections are becoming more stable and more partisan. Okay, um, and uh, this is, of course, um, uh, especially since about the mid, uh, since about the early 1990s, 
And we see the same thing happening here uh, in Senate elections in which partisanship or the strength or impact of partisan identification uh, is growing and is also more stable. The impact of that is more stable in Senate elections, again, shaping the outcome of what happens uh, in the Senate. And this is, of course, in the context of growing ideological polarization uh, at the mass level within the electorate. Um, here's a figure that suggests that um, Republicans and Democrats are more ideologically divided today than they were in the past. If you look at the uh, placement of the median Democrat in 1994 on the liberal to conservative dimension and um, its relation to the median Republican in the electorate, those two uh, medians are fairly close to each other, suggesting they're, they're not very far apart in 1994. Uh, 10 years later in 2004, the medians are roughly at the same place they were 10 years earlier, suggesting there had not been very much growth in polarization over this decade. But if you look at uh, that and compare it to 2014, you see that the medians have shifted pretty dramatically in opposite directions, such that the distance between the me median Democrat in the electorate and the median Republican is relatively far apart. This is at the mass level, and of course, it is well known that this type of polarization has also happened at the elite level in terms of members of uh, uh, Congress. You can also see evidence of party polarization uh, in 2018. Those who identified as Democrats, 95% of them voted for the Democratic House candidate. Those who identified as Republicans uh, ident um, uh, voted for the Republican candidate for the House 94% of the time. And of course, this is what's happening in presidential races as well. Of course, turnout matters and who wins depends on who votes, not just in presidential elections, but in down ballot races uh, for Congress that we will have this year. Um, we can see that there has been um, um, uh, the level of voter turnout in elections um, has waxed and waned uh, over the entire history of our elections. Um, we do see some uh, optimistic news in presidential elections in recent cycles. Turnout has been roughly 60% of the eligible electorate. It was just above 60% in 2016. Uh, it was a little bit lower than that in 2012, but higher, about 62% of the eligible electorate in 2008. Um, turnout in presidential elections tends to be considerably higher than in midterm election cycles, about 10 to 15 percentage points higher in presidential election cycles, but we're still nowhere near the levels of the uh, mid-1850s and early 1900s, which approximated 80% turnout, but we're also not as low as some election cycles uh, in um, uh, the for, between the 1950s. Uh, and the 1990s or so, uh, which sometimes dipped fairly close to 50% of the eligible electorate. So um, you might think that's good news that 60% of the electorate will, will vote in the presidential election. That still means about 40% typically don't vote in presidential elections, which means there's a lot of room for growth uh, in terms of uh, mobilizing voters in, uh, to vote in presidential election cycles. We do see dramatic differences in voter turnout by several key demographic uh, characteristics. Uh, if we compare presidential turnout by race and ethnicity, if we look at um, evidence from 2008 to 2016, um, we see that on average, 72% of whites um, uh, comp uh, comprise the um, electorate. The electorate is comprised uh, by white, 72% of the electorate is comprised by uh, whites, 28% of the electorate is um, comprised by non-whites, which includes 13% African Americans, 10% Hispanics, and 3% uh, Asians. So we do see um, pretty dramatic differences there and not very much uh, change across demographic groups or big dif over time, but big differences across groups. We also see uh, differences in turnout by uh, partisan identification in terms of the composition of the electorate, uh, as well as by age, which um, uh, suggests that uh, over the past three presidential election cycles, young voters aged 18 to 29 comprised uh, less than 20% uh, of the electorate. 
One of the reasons this might be happening uh, or some of these patterns might exist is because of the contacting strategies that have been adopted by the presidential campaigns uh, over the course of the past six decades. This is something that I explore more deeply in my recent book published by Oxford University Press called Bases Loaded, uh, how president, US presidential campaigns are changing and why it matters. Uh, if you look at the predicted probability of being contacted by a presidential campaign uh, to vote uh, in presidential election cycles over this period, you see that both pure, so-called pure independents, those who uh, really do not report any attachment to one of the political parties uh, or the other, that contact amongst these voters, as well as contact um, for strong partisans, those voters who um, report themselves to be either strong Democrats or strong Republicans, both of those things have been increasing uh, since 1956, but the rate of increase for strong partisans has outpaced the rate of contact uh, increase amongst pure independents. You see that the gap between the dotted line here and the solid line here is growing uh, over time, such that in 2016, um, there was a pretty sizable gap between how many strong partisans reported being contacted to vote in the presidential race compared to pure uh, independents. Uh, this has implications for who votes. And if you just look at turnout by partisan intensity here over the period 1956 to 2016, again, this is um, described further and discussed in Bases Loaded, you see that turnout among strong partisans has been growing. Uh, first of all, it's considerably higher than for other partisan groups here, uh, over 80% consistently over this period of strong partisans are voting and in recent cycles, including 2016, it's been closer to 90%. But turnout amongst the other partisan subgroups and in particular amongst those voters who are so-called pure independents has been eroding. Um, uh, you see that turnout amongst pure independents, which was about, let's say 68, 69% uh, in the 1950s has dropped to about 45%. That's a pretty sizable drop. In fact, the only uh, increase in turnout that we detect over this period is for strong partisans. Uh, that has implications for the kinds of uh, candidates that get, uh, that get elected uh, in congressional races, as well as races for president, but in other types of elections as well. And I argue in the book, this has contributed to partisan polarization uh, writ large. So what's going to happen this year? Well, I borrow here uh, some reflections and observations from some of my colleagues who have been um, uh, studying campaigns and congressional elections for decades. Uh, one of my most admired colleagues and uh, a renowned political scientist formerly at uh, Yale, David Mayhew, uh, has um, uh, shared an analysis looking at which party, looking at what happens for parties that win the majority in the House in a midterm election cycle two years later in the presidential election that follows? Uh, and if you look at whether or not those parties that win the House majority in the midterm, the Democrats, of course, won the House majority in the midterm in 2018. So what happens with the presidency two years later? Well, uh, roughly half the time, you can see here which years um, they win and which years they lose. Um, they win the presidency uh, two years later, but roughly half the time they don't. So um, uh, it's uh, a little unpredictable what will happen with the presidency two years later after a party wins a majority in a midterm. It's a little bit more predictable based on this evidence to think about what's going to happen with the House majority two years later. Um, uh, in every election cycle, that followed the midterm cycle in which a, how a party won the majority of the House seats uh, since 1956, they have also uh, won the House majority two years later. So um, it's, it's been since 1952 when a party that won the House majority in the midterm did not win the House majority uh, two years later. So there's pretty compelling evidence here that the chances are very good, as Cornell pointed out, that the uh, Democrats will keep control of the U.S. House. Um, it's a little less clear what will happen with the Senate. Let me just also share some, an analysis that I did um, looking at 
uh, congressional reelection rates in presidential years from 1964 to 2012. This is not a ton of election cycles. There's only nine of them in which incumbents were running in uh, either won or lost. So we have six cases in which incumbents won those um, election cycles, incumbent presidents, that is. Uh, the re-election rate in the House averaged 92.9%. Now, obviously, things are very different in the House where districts can be gerrymandered to make it difficult for, um, for challenges, et cetera. But, you know, this is a relatively high rate of re-election and roughly what it is for uh, cycles in the three cycles in this data in which the incumbents lost, Ford in 76, Carter in 1980, and George H.W. Bush in 1992. Uh, in the Senate, again, um, the rates are pretty high. If you look at overall what happened, though, um, the re-election rates for members of the Senate in cycles in which incumbent presidents lost are about 20 percentage points lower than uh, they are for cycles in which the incumbent presidential candidate won, 88% versus 67%, roughly. Uh, and in terms of overall seat numbers, what was happening for the president's party in the Senate um, by whether or not the incumbent president won or lost, um, on average, there was no change in um, seats gained or lost by the president's party in cycles when the incumbent presidential candidate won. But on average, the uh, president's party lost three seats um, in election cycles over this period in which the incumbent presidential candidate lost, uh, which, of course, would be enough for the Democrats to gain control of the Senate if Biden wins the presidency and if, the, if they're just average in 2020. Um, so what do the forecasts look like from uh, analysts who have been looking very closely at this? Again, I'll share some of this with you. Um, you may have seen it in other contexts. Um, some of the places that I like to go to when uh, trying to get a sense of uh, some of the best uh, research on this, uh, of course, is my political science colleagues, as well as some analysts, including Nate Silver at 538. Uh, Again, we see that the chances of the Democrats controlling the House of Representatives are very, very strong. Uh, Nate gives uh, a 96 in 100 um, chance that Democrats will retain control, only four uh, chances in 100 that the Republicans will gain control. Not only is, uh, the, uh, are the chances of controlling the House very high for Democrats, but they've also remained very stable um, over the course of August 1st to uh, roughly where we are now in the campaign cycle. Uh, we see a little bit more change uh, in the likelihood of Democrats controlling uh, the U.S. Senate. And uh, we see here that the chances of the Democrats gaining control of the Senate have um, been higher than the chances of Republicans uh, keeping control of the Senate over this period. But the gap or the likelihood that Democrats would gain control of the Senate um, has really started to climb um, since about uh, mid-September in, uh, in, in these analyses, such that it is now um, you know, over 70% chance that the Democrats will gain control of the Senate uh, in, in 2020. Um, if you want to look at some, um, some of the specific uh, races and the projected margins of victory and some of the uh, incumbents uh, who might be in danger, um, here's the 538 analysis that zooms in on specific Senate races. And you can see among the uh, Senate seats most likely to flip are the Senate um, uh, race uh, in Iowa. Um, uh, Ernst is probably one of the most vulnerable. Uh, Republicans uh, running, um, but there's also um, other vulnerable Republicans uh, in North Carolina, Susan Collins uh, in Maine, uh, McSally in Arizona, um, you know, and, and several others if you, if you just uh, drill down to some of these other races. Uh, of course, the Republicans, as Cornell said, are defending more seats in 2020. Uh, the polar opposite of the situation Democrats, um, the, the Republicans were in in 2018 when Democrats had to uh, defend a disproportionate number of seats. And really the only real uh, danger for um, Democrats uh, losing a seat is uh, the seat in um, Alabama that Jones currently holds. 
Okay. Um, political scientists are also good at forecasting elections. They do quite well. Um, I'll show you some of the forecasts in a minute for the presidential race that were released um, last week by political scientists, but there are a couple of political science forecasting models here that uh, estimate what they think will happen uh, in 2020. And you can see that one of the forecasting models um, predicts that Republicans will lose 32 seats in the House. That's pretty dramatic, uh, but that is what this estimate uh, shows. Uh, and they'll lose 12 seats in the Senate. My own personal view is that this is likely somewhat high, um, but uh, if you take a look at what the so-called fundamentals suggest should happen uh, in the House and Senate this year, if you take into consideration uh, factors like the state of the economy, et cetera, uh, it might be an idiosyncratic year in part because of the pandemic and because of its implications for the economy and the kinds of variables that go um, into these models. Uh, but that suggests a pretty um, deep loss uh, for the GOP in 2020. And the second model here um, suggests that Republicans should lose uh, six seats uh, in the House, does not have a, um, a Senate forecast here. But um, here's what the political science forecasts are for president. Of course, there's two ways of doing these forecasts. Political scientists used to predict mainly the popular vote winners, which was typically, which typically coincides with the electoral vote winner, but not always, as we saw in 2000, as well as in 2016. Nevertheless, uh, all but two of these um, presidential forecasts suggest Biden will win um, the popular vote. Um, uh, the uh, average forecast suggests that uh, Trump will get 47.8% of the two-party popular vote for president. Um, they also uh, estimate, but we, we also know that the popular vote doesn't always win the electoral vote, so political scientists have been shifting their attention more so in recent years to the electoral college vote. Here are some forecasts by um, uh, seven political scientists that look at what should happen in terms of the electoral vote. Uh, again, here, all but two um, suggest that Biden should be the electoral college vote winner. Um, and you can see that um, many of these um, or, you know, or, or many of these models are estimated uh, long before election day and take into consideration uh, factors that are in place and that are shaping what's likely to happen uh, in 2020. So this gives you a sense of what political scientists think should happen in the presidential race, which of course is going to influence what happens uh, in the congressional races. So that's um, an assessment of where things might stand, sort of how I see it and the kind of evidence and context that I um, take into consideration when thinking about these election cycles. I'm happy to talk about some further details. And I'm also happy to encourage you to uh, pick up a copy of my latest book, Bases Loaded, that I alluded to earlier, that talks mainly about presidential elections, but uh, their implications for uh, down ballot and congressional races. So thanks very much. I hope that was useful. And I look forward to your questions. All right. Great. Hey, thanks, Costas. That was terrific. Um, so let me let me start off some of the with some questions. Um, let me ask you, what do you think's driving? Uh, what are the issues driving the election in, in for the congressional seats this year? And are they different than what's going on at the presidential level? Do you think? Well, uh, given what I said earlier about the nationalization of congressional elections, uh, I think that national conditions are driving what's happening uh, in considerations for congressional races this year. Um, nationally, we know that the top issues, unsurprisingly, the economy is the top issue. Um, it's, it's an issue for Democrats and for Republicans. Uh, it's, it's traditionally a very important issue, but other important issues uh, include things like the coronavirus um, pandemic, uh, unsurprisingly includes things like Supreme Court nominations, which um, considerations about Supreme Court nominations uh, were, were traditionally more important for uh, Republicans than for Democrats. But in this election cycle, the polls suggest that Democrats are um, are much more in heavily influenced by their views of uh, what should happen or what they would prefer to happen uh, with respect to Supreme Court nomination. So those issues are very important. And of course, the number two issue for Americans generally is healthcare. 
uh, but it is, there's a big difference between Democrats and Republicans on how uh, important this issue is. Democrats um, are, uh, find this, by, by much higher margins, find this to be a very important issue compared to Republicans. So of course, some of the other issues that are important, you know, so-called law, law and order, uh, foreign policy, immigration, et cetera, but they're much further down the list compared to those four issues that are topping the issue agenda this year. And of course, um, uh, uh, in re recent polls suggest that Biden has an advantage uh, on um, the coronavirus, keeping the country unified, et cetera. But one of the issues in which Biden had a disadvantage over Trump for most of this election cycle was on the issue of the economy. Voters um, expressed trusting Trump to handle the economy uh, more so than Biden for most of this election cycle. But in the um, New York Times Siena poll that came out uh, in the past couple of days, um, they're roughly evenly split in terms of who uh, voters trust to handle the economy, which is uh, very good news for Joe Biden because it was a very, very, uh, it's the most important issue. And it's also one in which he was at a disadvantage for most of this election cycle. He seems to be making up for that as voters are now split on who they trust more to handle uh, economic matters. Right, right. So uh, Larry Fox asked a question about the polarization data you showed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was wondering, you know, it shows that there wasn't much growth in polarization amongst the mass public between 1994 and 2004. And he's he's, but then it increases after that. And he thought that was odd given the role that uh, Gingrich played in Congress in the mid 1990s. That mm -hmm. the polarization would have occurred under him. So so, what's your sense of that? Was was Gingrich a driver of polarization or not? Yeah, I think that's likely true. I mean, we saw evidence of um, intensifying polarization amongst elites much sooner and much more reliably than you know, when we saw it amongst the general public. Um, and so if anything, it does seem to be the case um, that the elites were polarizing somewhat earlier. Uh, eventually though, it made its way into the mass level and now uh, the public is increasingly polarized along ideological uh, lines. Uh, and um, you know, one of the manifestations of that um, you know, one of the implications of it is that in this election cycle in 2020, there's actually uh, very few undecided voters. Um, you know, uh, it's roughly half the number of undecided voters at this stage of the campaign than we had in 2016. Um, you know, almost no one is undecided about how they feel about Donald Trump. And that's partly because of their own ideological views, right? Because of how they feel about Trump, but also how they feel about Democrats and Republicans generally and their attachment to those, to those partisan labels. Um, you know, uh, we know, for example, and some of the other evidence I summarize in Basis Loaded suggests that voters are increasingly making up their minds about who they're gonna vote for in presidential elections earlier and earlier. And I describe the persuadable or swing voters in my book as elusive. They are increasingly fewer and fewer in number. Uh, everyone um, has their respective political, partisan, and ideological camps, uh, and it's very, very hard to dislodge people from those camps, uh, and they go in with those predispositions into the voting booth. And so um, one of the manifestations of that at the presidential campaigning level is that um, parties and candidates have been increasingly focusing their efforts on their bases uh, versus uh, independents or swing voters or persuadable voters or whatever you want to call them. Okay. Uh, Jim Casterling asks about uh, the role of gerrymandering and its impact on incumbent strength. Is that why we see incumbent, uh, the incumbent advantage going down? Yeah, well, um, you know, this is clearly um, an important consideration in terms of house races. Um, and um, you know, we do see evidence of gerrymandering in, in, in house districts, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, things can vary pretty dramatically across parties, depending on who controls the, the redistricting process in those states. Some states have nonpartisan commissions who do it. Other, in other places, the legislatures do it. Uh, and it depends on who controls those legislatures, which party controls them, et cetera. What I will say about gerrymandering is that this is why uh, even um, non-presidential election cycles um, uh, are important, right? Because Democrats made lots of gains, not only uh, 
um, at the congressional level in 2018, but also in state houses and state legislatures across the country. Uh, and those gains are going to be very important to them in the aftermath of the 2020 census in which redistricting will have to occur. Um, you know, this is an advantage that Republicans had in the previous cycle. Now the Democrats have it. And so, um, you know, there are important implications for what happens uh, in elections, not only at the national level, but also in state legislatures across the country, because this is one of the things that they will be charged with doing in many states uh, after 2020. Yeah, I wonder, you know, so I, I was fascinated by uh, the fact that the incumbency advantage has been declining over the last 30 years or so. But at the same time, the rate at which incumbents get elected has stayed the same in the House and actually gone up in the Senate. So yeah. what explains that disparity? And could part of that be about uh, about uh, uh, gerrymandering and uh, part of it about geographic sorting? Well, uh, yes, absolutely, gerrymandering and, um, and geographic sorting, but also polarization, right? Because of the fact that uh, voters are either decidedly Democratic or Republican in their orientations, it leaves very little room for things like the personal vote, cultivating a personal vote, right? Um, even for uh, members of Congress who manage to do that and to do that effectively, it doesn't mean that they're going to convince Republicans uh, to vote for them if they're Democrats, right, uh, or vice versa. Um, you know, in, incumbents uh, invest a tremendous amount of effort uh, into cultivating a personal vote, but it doesn't necessarily accrue support from the other side. Perhaps that likelihood of that is eroding, but they might also be uh, either more selective in who they're helping or the people reaching out to them for help and support are sorting themselves such that uh, only Republicans or mainly Republicans are reaching out to their members for help and constituency service if their members share ideological uh, or partisan affinities versus um, Republicans. And so I think it's all those factors, but partisan polarization is certainly playing a role in that because it is, um, I think, uh, diminishing incumbents' ability to uh, perform constituency service and cultivate a personal vote. Okay. Uh, Joshua Hiller asks about rural states and uh, the fact that they tend to vote so heavily Republican right now. Is that likely to change in the future? Not so long ago, they used to be Democratic or or um, swing areas. Is, yeah. is there, are we going to see any change in that, do you think, or, or is well, this here with us to stay? You know, my sense is we'll likely see some change of that in, in 2020. And what I uh, will wonder about if that actually materializes is whether that might be uh, an outlier, whether it might be idiosyncratic because of what's happening with the pandemic or a reaction to Donald Trump, or whether that might be part of a larger pattern or a larger trend. I think that um, that will be one of the challenges for how to think about contextualize and study 2020 in that we won't know if these, uh, if any changes or developments that we observe in this cycle are uh, specific to this cycle or the current circumstances. Uh, of uh, the pandemic and the economic fallout and Donald Trump himself, or whether or not they're part of a larger, um, um, you know, uh, changes uh, that we that we might observe. Uh, that remains to be seen. Of course, one of the um, uh, geographical dimensions to this that uh, we're likely to see in 2020 is um, increasing uh, an increasing shift in a blue direction within the suburban community, particularly um, suburban women. Uh, this is something that we saw, um, you know, this was an important constituency for Donald Trump in 2016, uh, but also uh, the movement within that group of voters in 2018 helped Democrats accrue the kind of gains they, they got in 2018. And that seems to be continuing in 2020. Again, it's unclear whether this is a reaction to Trump or a long-term uh, pattern or change that might uh, become reinforced even in the aftermath of 2020. Yeah. So uh, I have someone who asked about the uh, Barrett nomination, and you said a little bit about it earlier. I wonder if you mm -hmm. could uh, say a little bit more about how you think it's going to impact the congressional, especially the Senate races. Uh, there's several uh, uh, vulnerable members of the Senate who this might be crucial for, like Lindsey Graham or Susan Collins or some others. So, so what do you think about that? Well, my sense is that this is energizing the bases in both parties. And I would have said that it's energizing the Republican base more than the Democratic base uh, if it had not been 
or the polling evidence that I've seen that suggests that Democrats are just as energized about this, if not more energized than Republicans in 2020. So um, my sense is that, um, you know, the, the, the fact that this is happening uh, right in the midst of a campaign cycle in which voters are, you know, millions of votes have already been cast, uh, I, you know, I think um, is, uh, is, is raising the salience of Supreme Court um, appointments as an issue in the electorate. And I don't think it's going to surpass concerns about the economy or health care or, or the coronavirus situation. But I do think that this is going to be uh, and a very important issue for many, many voters, especially in the Senate races. Uh, and, um, you know, I do think that, that, um, that, we, that Democrats uh, are um, extremely motivated by what's happening on that front this cycle. Okay. Um, so let me ask you about the, uh, you know, in, in 2018, we saw a blue wave. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of freshmen Democrats in Congress right now, and typically freshmen are more vulnerable uh, in re-elections. Uh, do you see any any vulnerability there? Do you think there's going to be a lot of those who lose their seats, or are they looking pretty solid at, at this point? Well, um, I think most of them are looking pretty solid, and in part it's because a lot of the freshmen uh, are Democrats, right? And, um, you know, the chances of maintaining control um, are pretty solid, as well as the um, um, uh, support, you know, the, the generic ballot um, for, for House seats this year advantages Democrats by about six points right now. It's very difficult to translate that into actual seats. But the general mood of the country seems to favor Democrats with respect to the House and in the generic congressional ballot, uh, congressional vote. And so um, my sense is that um, that it'll be um, somewhat easier for Democratic freshmen. Uh, and of course, um, that's the, the lion's share of them at this point. Okay. Uh, Julia Ionelli asks about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and wh whether it's impacting the congressional elections and also whether or not the congressional, the outcome in the congressional elections will impact the movement. Well, I think both. I think it is Im impacting the, um, the election. It's impacting the election um, for several reasons. Uh, one of the things it's doing is it's allowing Donald Trump to put law and order uh, on the uh, policy agenda in a very prominent way. Right now, of course, Trump is in polls disadvantaged on this issue. The country seems to think that Biden would be better at handling law and order uh, issues, according to recent polls. But nevertheless, the developments and the protests and the Black Lives Matter um, movement is um, uh, is 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 sh shifting is heightening the salience of law and order as an issue. I don't think it would be as important an issue in this uh, cycle had it not been for those uh, developments. But it is also uh, raising the or motivating um, people of color, um, African Americans, and 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 others who support them. Uh, and social justice in this country. Uh, it is, um, you know, capitalizing on what's happening on this moment in, uh, in American history to, uh, to take a stand, um, especially in light of some of the allegations of the, um, you, know, you know, of just um, uh, 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 in contrast to some of the things the White House has been doing with respect to uh, its refusal to repudiate white supremacy and other types of uh, other similar types of allegations, uh, it's it's energizing the left and it's energizing people of color to make their voices heard. Uh, and I think that that is uh, likely to manifest in higher levels of turnout for those voters relative to 2016. We already see that relative to 2016. Okay, I got uh, I have uh, two different questions, but about the same thing about your forecasting model and, and analysis. Mm -hmm. So Alex Hammond asks, did you do this a similar forecast in 2016 and how how did it stack up? <laughs> and um, Ashley Willoughby asks if your model and forecasting analysis takes into account voter turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it does uh, in the sense that, um, first of all, those are not uh, my forecasts, right? Uh, they're uh, forecasts others have, have put together using you know, a bunch of different variables and different approaches, et cetera. But they are, I think, very good forecasts. Um, and, um, you know, they're what, I, they're what I look to, to to get a sense of what's likely to happen. Um, and so uh, 
many of those, because of the data that comprise them, take voter turnout into account because in part, uh, polls take voter turnout into account. Most of the polling that we see is uh, support for the candidates among likely voters, right? And those are estimates that have been compiled by taking into consideration who's likely to vote in the election cycle, right? Not all polls do that, but most of them, particularly at this stage of the election game, um, are uh, likely voter polls, which do take into consideration um, uh, voter turnout. Uh, what I will say though, and what I think that the question from, I guess, Alex Hammond is asking is, you know, how reliable are the polls, right? And how reliable are they likely to be this year? How reliable were they in 2016? I think there is this misperception out there that the polls were not very reliable in 2016. Now that I have analyzed, and what I found is that the polls were actually quite accurate, at least the national polls um, uh, predicting the popular vote winner in 2016 were very were pretty accurate. For the most part, they projected that Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote, uh, which she did by about as much as she did. Uh, and um, you know, the, you know, if most of them with it were within the so-called margin of error, right? I mean, the uncertainty was there. We just didn't want to believe it was there because she was ahead in most of them, et cetera. But, you know, they were pretty, pretty, they, they were not um, huge differences between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, and most polls suggested that he was within striking distance, even in those national polls. There's a big difference uh, between being four or five percentage points ahead or behind in a poll which is uh, oftentimes within the margin of error. That's where Hillary Clinton was in 2016 at this stage, compared to being nine or 10 points or 11 points ahead uh, on average in the polls, uh, which is where Joe Biden finds himself uh, at a similar stage uh, in the campaign, which is typically outside of the margin of error, suggesting that that advantage of being ahead is actually real. Uh, it is outside the uncertainty bounds. And so I think that this advantage that Biden has in the polls, uh, whether or not it'll persist till election day is a different question, but it is, it is real. It's about twice as strong as Hillary Clinton's lead was in 2016, but it is also outside of the margin of error. It's a reliable uh, advantage that he has uh, in the polls. Where the polls were less reliable in 2016 were at the state level, and in particular in uh, certain states that turned out to be very important, like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, um, you know, uh, that was a humbling experience for lots of pollsters, but state level polls tend to be less reliable uh, in part, um, well, for lots of different reasons, but uh, I think pollsters learned lots of lessons in 2016. One of the lessons they learned is that they really weren't factoring in the importance of discrepancies across levels of uh, educational attainment. Okay? And because there were big differences in supporting either Clinton or Trump in 2016 by educational attain attainment, failing to take that into consideration skewed the polls somewhat, right? And I think pollsters learned that lesson and many of them are now factoring and taking into account so-called waiting for educational attainment because we still see discrepancies across levels of educational attainment in whether or not they support Biden or Trump, just like we did in whether or not voters uh, supported Trump or Clinton uh, in 2016. So we've learned some lessons. I think polls are likely better in 2020 at the state level, but at the national level, not only are they likely better in 2020, but I actually don't think the 2016 polls were that bad. Uh, they were actually quite accurate at the end of the day. Right. And we had actually we had Charles Franklin on last week and he 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 was eating some humble pie about his own poll in Wisconsin yeah. years ago. Well, I and hope he said some similar things because- uh, He did know, the I, exact same thing. It was the problem of waiting education, which he's yeah. corrected for this time around. So, so. Um, let me ask you a little bit about what might be the impact on policy, assuming these forecasts uh, turn out to be accurate and Democrats uh, take control of the White House, take control of the Senate, retain control of the House. We have unified government again. Um, so there's a lot of speculation about what might happen. You know, will they get rid of a filibuster in the Senate? Will they, will they pack the court? Uh, what, what do you think will be the real impact of unified government again? Well, I think if we have a, um, a democratic sweep uh, in 2020, uh, and we return to unified government, there is a danger of overreaching. Right. There is a danger that the Democrats will try to uh, move too far 
uh, in one direction and um, cause a reaction or backlash. Uh, we already know that um, the president's party is likely to lose seats in the midterm uh, and uh, in the Senate, even if they get control, it's still likely to be fairly close and they may not be able to afford to risk too many, you know, risk losing seats in 2022. Uh, so I do think that Democrats would need to be cautious, but some of their top priorities will get done. So um, there will be, um, you know, um, a priority to reinforce and improve, but keep in place uh, Obamacare and health care, which is uh, what most Democrats care about in terms of voters, uh, in terms of, um, you know, how important this issue is to them. Uh, it was critically important in 2018, et cetera. Danger of losing health care, abolishing things like pre-existing conditions is something that's very top of mind for Democrats and Republicans, but particularly Democrats. And I think on that front, they're likely to be, um, you know, uh, to have a, a commitment to keep that at the top of the uh, issue agenda. My sense is they'll also um, backtrack and try to undo some of the things that uh, Donald Trump has done, particularly in the area of climate and immigration, also important issues for Democrats, uh, as well as um, tax policy. Uh, but it's going to be challenging for Democrats because uh, the economy is still likely to be in a challenging place after this election cycle and into 2021. Um, and, you know, uh, so will the fallout from the kinds of things like the um, relief packages that they've already passed, et cetera, the deficit, the tax policies that uh, the Trump administration has adopted, et cetera. Nobody likes tax increases uh, and their implications and how they will manifest th themselves uh, in, the, in the economy uh, more broadly uh, and the implications they will have. Uh, so I think they will have, um, if the Democrats do manage to win and sweep across the board, uh, I think they'll 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 have to be quite cautious because they will still not be in a position to potentially do everything they would want to do uh, or move in the direction too quickly that they'd want to move in the direction. But there's likely to be some uh, issue priorities for them that they will act on uh, immediately or very quickly. Uh, and um, you know, I think uh, the, we're seeing. Um, um, glimpses of that already and how they're talking on the campaign trail. But I, I noticed you didn't say anything about about institutional reforms like uh, like filibuster reform or packing, ch expanding the size of the court or uh, statehood for D.C. You think all those are off the table or do you think there's a, no, a I don't, possibility? I don't, think any, I don't think any of those are off the table, but I do think um, they would have to tread cautiously because uh, what they do on those issues, even if they have the power and the, you know, the, uh, even if they're able to do it, will have implications, potentially long-term implications, right? Uh, look at changes they made during Harry Reid's tenure in the Senate that are now coming back uh, to, to be, um, you know, uh, Democrats are, you know, are, 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 are facing, these are some of the criticisms that were coming up uh, at the time. Uh, and yet here we are, and I so, uh, so I think they'll have to take very seriously, consider very seriously the un any unintended consequences and any political fallout that could come from dramatic changes like that. They're not off the table. But I also think um, what Democrats do will depend in large part to how Republicans would react to, um, to losing control of the Senate and the presidency, right? Will they see this as a repudiation of Donald Trump um, and the kinds of not only his approach, but also his policies um, uh, and, 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 and not look introspectively at the party and themselves and how they conducted themselves and the policies they advocated, et cetera, uh, and just kind of overlook that. Or will they take a serious look at where the party is, what it stands for, what it believes, uh, what it symbolizes, how the approach, um, will there be kind of an introspective moment like that uh, that Republicans, um, you know, uh, humble themselves in a sense uh, after such losses and think about how to work with Democrats and reach across the aisle to get things done for the American people, or um, will they react in a much more um, uh, 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 bombastic way, if you will, um, and, um, uh, you know, just... Uh, view uh, any such losses as a rejection of tr 
of Trump, but not necessarily of his policies and, and style. Uh, and so I think that uh, much of what's likely to um, unfold will depend on uh, how both parties would react to such circumstances, not just one or the other. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, our time is up now. Um, before I, I thank our guests, let me remind you, we have two events coming up next week. We added a, an extra event. That's on Monday at noon. Uh, we have Amanda Hollis Brusky from Pomona College. She's going to be talking about the Barrett nomination and how that might be impacting the election. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, on October 28th at noon, we have uh, one of my colleagues at WSU, Travis Riddout and Katie Searles from uh, Louisiana State University, and they're gonna be talking about the role of the media in this election. Now, again, if you want more information about any of these events or uh, any of our programs at, at uh, the Foley Institute, be sure to like us on Facebook or go to our website at foley.wsu.edu. Uh, uh, Costas, thanks again. It was a, a terrific presentation. Helps us understand what uh, we can expect uh, on November 3rd. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. And we'll see you all next week.